Welcome to the online service of Harborsite Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join the morning service already in progress. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. It is December, and there will be some messages around a very familiar theme that being the birth of our Savior. I want to preach a message to you that I have simply entitled The Song of Simeon. Simeon is a character in the Bible. He's only mentioned here in Luke chapter 2 in the Word of God. And he is one of the first. Now think about this first. He is one of the first to hold the creator and savior, Jesus Christ. One of the very first ones. Besides Mary and Joseph and maybe some family members, you know how that is. You pass babies around, you know how that works out. But I want us to look at this particular passage of scripture. I may preach another a message next Sunday uh, to kind of flesh out my thoughts there. But you're in Luke chapter 2. Let me begin reading in verse uh, 25, and we'll read down through verse 35, and then I'll pray. Luke 2, 25 says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit in the temple. And when the parents, that's Mary and Joseph, brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, Now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel." And for a sign which shall be spoken against, yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to look into your word now. We thank you for the service already. We thank you for the hymns that we've been able to uh, sing once again and uh, remind us of the birth of our Savior. And we ask that you would help us, Lord, not to become so familiar with the activities of Christmas, maybe the month of December as a whole, that we forget why we celebrate the birth of our Savior. May we not get so caught up in, in all that goes on and the busyness of it that we, we miss it. We miss the blessings. Help us to have time, Lord, and to take time to just very quietly, uh, maybe somewhere by ourselves uh, during the month of December, just to get away and and commune with you uh, privately and just thank you personally for the, the blessed gift of your Son. We pray your blessings upon our time. We ask that you would... Remove any of the distractions that have come our way now. Help us to focus our attention upon your word, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is the Song of Simeon? Before we get into that, I want us to look at, firstly, his temperament. What kind of man was he? And again, he's only mentioned here in all of God's word in Luke chapter 2, these very few verses, but it mentions there... Uh, that he was, as it says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just. What does it mean to be just? Well, 
the word just in the New Testament, it refers to those who are called just. They have conditioned their lives by the standard which is not theirs but God's. How many of you have ever had to, maybe in your work, um, maybe it is in your academics, you have to live up to a standard? You know, maybe it was that, uh, how many of you played sports when you were in school or participated in some other uh, activity where your grades were important? You had to, and I think the standard uh, for many school athletes is a, a C average, okay? You have to be living at that standard in order to participate. Uh, so if you do that, you could say that you are just in, in that regard. Um, I was reading some time ago a book about the uh, Army Rangers, which is a special forces uh, group in the United States military, and the, the Ranger Code, their Ranger um, regiment, their group has put together a, a, a list of standards for everyone from the lowest of rank to the highest of rank, if you are in the Ranger Regiment in the United States Army, you have to live to standard every day. And if you're not living to standard every day, and it's noticed by somebody, regardless of whether you are a general or a private, whoever happens to see that can call you out on it and say, look, you're not living to standard. You need to get with the program. You need to, to, to tighten up, and you need to start living according to our standards. Well, if you think about it, uh, to some degree, that is a biblical principle, isn't it? What are the standards that a Christian should live by? Well, we find them in God's Word. My question to you is this. Are you living by the standard which is yours or God's? Because Simeon is noted for his righteousness, if you want to call it that. It could be translated, the word just could be translated righteous. It's the same word in the original language. But these people are people who are related to God and who, as a result of this relationship, walk with God. Now, again, you have to answer this question. Are you related to God? And I'm, what I'm talking about is, of course, are you one of his children? And I'm not talking about the greater idea, the bigger idea of the, the fatherhood of God, because we know that everybody that was ever created from Adam to now was created by whom? God. God. So we are all, in a matter of speaking, God's children in that we are creatures created by him. But that's just the general definition. That's a general idea. What I'm speaking of is a little bit more specific. Do you know God as your father through your relationship with Jesus Christ, because you trusted Christ as your Savior and thus been added to the family of God. That's the distinction we have to make, and I, I'm trying to do that this morning because we're talking about a man that undoubtedly had that kind of relationship with God. Now, it, the definition goes on in regard to this New Testament uh, word being just it is a person who is justified by faith and shows forth this faith by his works now we've been learning in the book of james some time ago that you know i can say well i believe in god i can say i'm a christian i can say i'm a member of a church i can say i'm a member of harborside baptist church and go no further what have I proven? Really nothing. But if I say I'm a Christian and I live a certain way and I live a certain way according to 
what God's standard is that we find in his word, that gives credence and that gives some, some gravitas, if you want to call it that, some weight to my words. My grandfather, my grandmother, I never really heard them say very often, if ever, in my memory anyway, that they were Christians. They were. I know that. I know their testimonies. I've heard them tell it. But when their lives showed that they knew Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they didn't really have to continually say, I'm a Christian, because they were living it. And that's the standard that Simeon was living by. I want you to hold your finger in Luke chapter 2 and turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul gives us some thought in regard to this word just and what it means to be related to God in that way, living by God's standard. Notice, if you will, Romans 3 and verse 20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. What is he talking about? He's talking about just performing a certain way. Because there are a lot of people, even in the 21st century, even in the, uh, the, the third day of December 2023, that across this country, maybe even across this world, are sitting in churches even now, have maybe have made the commitment to be members of that church. They call themselves Christians, and yet they're living their lives without Christ. Is that possible? The answer to the question is, yes, it is. But he goes on and he says, there, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, now notice, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation or a satisfaction through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of them which believeth in Jesus. Now what are we talking about? What is justification? What is, how, how is a man deemed just? Is it by just his, his actions, his words, or is it a relationship? What is it? It's a relationship. And undoubtedly, if you go back to Luke chapter 2, undoubtedly Simeon had a relationship with the Lord like we're talking about. You say, well, how did that happen? In a matter of speaking, he was an Old Testament saint, Right? Because Jesus was just born. Jesus was just a few days old. At most, he might have been 40 days or so old. But regardless, he's still an infant. He hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't died. He wasn't buried. He hadn't been raised from the dead yet. So how does Simeon have the kind of relationship that we're talking about with God that, that deemed him just. People have asked that question to me. Well, how did, how did people in the Old Testament get saved? Same way that people in the New Testament, including us in the church age, get saved. It's a little bit different in that they were looking forward. They were putting their trust in what God was going to do through Christ. 
Now we look back to what Christ did, what God did through Christ. But it's the same kind of faith. And Simeon undoubtedly had it. You know how I know that? Because he was just. See, God, in his word, deems Simeon just and justified. Why? How? Because he had a relationship with the Lord. And I can't get into all those particulars. Well, how does, he, how does he have a relationship with a baby before the baby became, you know, this and before that and so on and so forth? That's above my pay grade. <laughs> Sorry. But you have to understand something. When did Jesus become the Christ? This is not a trick question. When did Jesus become the Christ? From before the foundation of the world. He always has been. He is now. He always will be. Not only holy, not only God, but he will be the savior of all the world. And think about the wonderful thing that Simeon was able to do. To hold it in his hands. How amazing would that have been? But his temperament, he is just. He is also, it goes on and he says, there was a man named Simeon and the same man was just and devout. Okay. I've known some devout people. You probably have too. Okay. Um, They never miss a service. Doesn't matter what happens. I mean, unless they, you know, got a doctor's excuse or they're dead, they, they're, they're there in church, right? Uh, and, and so forth. But the word devout, uh, somebody that is devout is one who is careful in his worship of God and in his duties toward God. Question. Do Christians in this day and age, are we as careful as we should be. I can remember hearing my grandfather say something to me years ago. We were traveling somewhere, he and my grandmother and I, when I was at Indiana State University years ago, and we were going somewhere, and my grandfather's driving the car, and he says, Mother, he said, look there, do you remember that place? And she kind of nodded and made reference to the fact that she did remember that place. And, and, and that pricked my interest because it was something that, okay, um, what's that place? What's the importance of that place? It was a little gas station off the side of the road in the middle of nowhere, Indiana. And I said, what's so special about that place, Grandpa? And he said, well, Your grandmother and I were coming back on a Saturday. They had gone to visit or gone to some meetings or something. I don't remember exactly what the event was, but they were traveling, and it was getting on toward midnight. And at midnight, it would become Sunday morning. My grandfather was very, 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 very particular about doing certain things on Sunday. And a lot of certain things that you did not do, okay? And he was not going to buy gas on Sunday. That was a conviction that he had because he wanted to be careful about his relationship to the Lord, okay? And as he was driving through the country in Indiana many, many years ago, late on a Saturday, He told my grandmother, he said, Mother, we may be spending the night in the car. And she's like, oh? He said, yes, because we're almost out of gas. My grandmother got busy praying. (laughs) And just a few minutes before midnight, they spied that little gas station. They pulled in. They got a couple dollars worth of gas And we're able to go home. I will have to admit, 
I have never been that careful. But the word devout indicates one who is careful in his worship of God and his duties toward God. These kind of devout people are impressed with a natural or religious fear. They do not want in any way, shape, matter, or form to disappoint their Savior. They don't want to do it. And maybe they would even go to an extreme. But see, that's what Simeon was all about. He was very devout. God calls him that. He was very careful about his worship and his relationship with the Lord and his duties toward the Lord. It goes on here a little bit further. It says, There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting. How many of you like to wait? Just wait. Just be patient. He was patient. He was expectantly looking and waiting for something. I was listening to a gentleman years ago. He was talking about those that serve the Lord. Because when we talk about God's service, what do we often kind of in our mind, what kind of idea do we get? Somebody that is busy all the time, doing something all the time. He made this statement, and it was it's registered in my head ever since I heard it. He said, sometimes those that serve the Lord must stand and wait. Who wants to do that, though? Just wait. Here, let's stand over here. I'll get with you in a minute. And, of course, we know that's code, right? A minute is not 60 seconds, right? It's kind of like the difference between real world time and hospital time, right? Those of you that have ever been to the hospital, you know, and you go in there and they tell you the doctor will be right with you. You might as well just kick back and get comfortable because it's going to be a while. Undoubtedly, I was blessed, and let's see, five days from now, I will pass a, an anniversary. About 1.40 in the afternoon, 31 years ago, I had a very serious accident. And a couple hours later, I was sitting in the hospital in the emergency room in Greenville, South Carolina at Greenville Memorial Hospital waiting on a doctor. My right leg was about six inches shorter than it should have been because the head of my femur got shoved through my pelvis, had a machine flip over on me, and I dislocated, fractured my right hip. The nurse, who interestingly enough, whose name was Teresa, she came in and she's, you know, doing my workup and, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there and, and um, my, my hip is starting to really hurt because it's been a few hours since my accident. And uh, I asked the nurse, I said, um, would there be any possibility of me getting some pain meds? And she said, well, honey, the doctor has to see you first. And I said, well, tell him to hurry. She said, well, to be honest with you, we're slammed. That's, that's medical code for we're busy and there's, you know, you might have to wait, right? We're slammed and it might be a while. What are you going to do? You can't walk out, right? I said, well, okay. Tried to get comfortable and so forth, and, and within, within five minutes, the curtain came back. There was a doctor standing there who had my chart, and he said, Mr. Arbuckle, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and I said, praise the Lord. 
And he said, excuse me? And I said, well, the nurse said that you guys were slammed. And he said, yes, we are. And I said, and yet here you stand. How is it that you took my chart? And he said, well, it was in the middle of a big stack, and I just walked through the nurse's station and grabbed one, and it just happened to be yours. And I said, hallelujah. And he said, excuse me? Those kind of things, sometimes you have to learn to wait. I learned to wait. The doctor did give me some pain meds, some Tylenol. Didn't touch what I had. He said, we got to get some x-rays. I was like, okay, I figured. So the x-ray, the tech from up or wherever we went in that hospital came, got me. And she pushed me right up against the wall outside the the radiology department and said, they'll be out to get you. So guess what I had to learn to do? Wait. Wait. Be patient. I'll get to you. How many of us like to wait? Not I. No, I come from a long line of impatient people. My wife will tell you, don't ask her, she'll she'll tell you anyway. But what is he waiting for? He's expectantly looking for and waiting for, what does it say? Waiting for the consolation of Israel. How many have ever been beyond consolation? Something tragic happened in your life, maybe it was that there was a uh, a, a very sudden loss of a dear loved one or something else happened and you were beyond consolation. That person, that, that, that spouse, that family member, that close friend, that pastor, that church member, whoever it was came and, and, and even if they grabbed you and put their arms around you and patted you on the back and, and said it's going to be okay, you are beyond comfort. You ever been there? Ever done that? I know there have been a lot of times in my ministry when I had to go to such people. And what do you say? Too often what we do, no disrespect to God's word, but sometimes this is not in such a circumstance in a time like that. It's not the time to quote Romans 8, 28. Well, we know that all things work together for good. Okay, wait a minute. I I am about to bury one of my dearest, dearest people in all the world. I understand that. I've preached it. I've studied it. I've parsed it six ways from Sunday. I got that. Simeon was expectantly waiting very patiently for God to comfort Israel. Now, you have to understand when this was written. It's written about the first century A.D. Who was in charge of Israel at this time? It wasn't Israel. It was Rome. And they were pretty difficult and hard taskmasters. He's patiently waiting for God to comfort his people. Understand this. He is holding the source of that comfort. How amazing would that have been? Isaiah 51, turn there, hold your fingers in Luke. Turn to Isaiah 51. Notice what he says in verse number 3. For the Lord, 
Isaiah 51, 3 says, For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Answer this question for me. Is there that kind of joy and gladness and thanksgiving and voice of singing going on in Israel today? The answer is no, absolutely not. They are embroiled in a war. We've seen that on TV. We've read it in the news. But there is coming a day. There is coming a day. And what do we have to do for it? Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Just because we're waiting doesn't mean it's not going to happen. God has said it. That settles it. Whether you believe it or not. Whether you're patient or not. Whether you want to try and change it or not. Whether you want to do something about it or not. And Simeon was just simply willing to wait. He was patient. What do you think he was doing during that period of his life? He's probably doing a lot of praying, don't you think? He was probably, because he was just and devout, not only praying, but he was probably pointing other people to the, to, to the one who would eventually comfort their people. And oh, by the way, guess what? During this day, he got to hold him. Now, how, how amazing would that have been? It's a bit of an enigma, don't you think? To hold my creator, to hold the creator of everything that we know, to hold the one who from before the foundation of the world was going to die for me. How amazing would that have been? But his temperament is something for us to emulate. He was just. What's your relationship with the Lord? Are you careful about your worship and your duties Toward the Lord. Are you patiently waiting and patiently performing, I will say, what God would have you do until He comes and takes us home? He goes on and He says, He was devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and notice, and the Holy Ghost was upon Him. Now we have to understand something about this, okay? Prior to Pentecost, Prior to the coming of the Holy Spirit that ushered in the church age, okay, when people had a relationship with the Lord like we're talking about, the Holy Spirit did not come and live and reside in them. Jesus told his disciples, oh, this little baby, by the way, told his disciples 30-some years later, okay, wait. Because you will be endued with power, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will come and be in you. And today, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come upon us, He lives inside us. So that should make us even more devout, don't you think, and more careful about our relationship and our Worship of the Lord and, and our testimony to others because everywhere a Christian goes, who goes with them? God the Holy Spirit, right? Now that should terrify us a little bit, don't you think? But he was waiting for the comfort of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him. What does that mean? Well, he was endued with the Spirit. That had two, a twofold effect on Simeon. Firstly, he was taught by the Spirit. Now notice verse 26. It says, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. Okay? Where do we get 
God's Spirit to reveal anything to us today? It's right here. Right? It's right here. Now, my question to you is this. Have you found out anything recently? Some people say, no. Why not? I was listening to a message on the radio recently. A pastor was saying, he was talking about the word of God. And, and he was talking about the fact that he was, he was thankful to live in the United States of America because Bibles can be accessed and can be had and can be purchased almost anywhere you go. I mentioned that before some Sundays ago. You can go to Walmart and buy one. You can go to a lot of gas stations and buy one. So to say, well, I don't have a Bible. I don't know what God's word has to say. Okay, they're not that expensive. They're probably even less expensive than a large Starbucks beverage my wife was telling me about recently. She left her coffee at the house, so she had to order one with some of her coworkers. She got a little bitty whatever it was, something, something, something. Oh, it was smaller than that. It was, okay. Uh, how much does a thimble full of coffee from Starbucks cost you? I don't know. She paid about $6, between 5 and $6 for it. One of her coworkers said, that's nothing. Of course, she had one of them big, you know, the big gulp ones, I guess. Uh, and, and this was $17 worth of Starbucks, Okay. You can buy a Bible in America today for less than you would spend on Starbucks coffee. I don't mean to be so hard-nosed about it, but if you don't have a Bible, there's really no excuse for you not having a Bible because you can get one. I might be hard-pressed to figure out which one I might give you, but I've got enough of them. I could probably give you one if you want it. I've got one. As a matter of fact, it's, got, it's a, um, just a New Testament, um, but it's got a really nice uh, leather, um, kind of burgundy leather cover. I'd gladly give you that one. You wouldn't be able to read it, because it's in Koine Greek, but then again, I can't either, so hey. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit came upon him. You have to also understand this. One of the reasons the Holy Spirit undoubtedly was taught or was teaching Simeon is because Simeon was willing to be taught. He was taught by the Spirit. He was also led by the Spirit. Verse 27 says, and he came by the Spirit into the temple, just coincidentally on the exact day, at the exact time when Mary and Joseph brought that little bitty boy, baby Jesus, into the temple. Guess who showed up? Simeon, coincidentally, right? No. You see, the revelation of God's will led him to action. To answer this question for me, how many of us, don't raise your hands, but how many of us know what God's will is for our lives? Honestly. We have a general idea. Okay, I'm trying to help you. Okay, We have a general idea of what God's will is for our, us because we have a relationship with him. He is our father through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he's told us in his word what we ought to be doing. 
generally speaking. Right? Okay, now how many of us know what God's will is, generally speaking, for our lives and are going about doing that? See, that's the kicker, isn't it? Every spirit-filled believer will have the things of Christ revealed to them. And how do we get it revealed to us? Jump in and start swimming. Jump in and start digging, right? And we'll be led to fulfill what has been revealed, just like Simeon. Now, we don't know what the, what was the conversation between the Holy Spirit, the third person, the Trinity, and Simeon. I don't know. But we do know that it was very specific to some degree, as least, at, at least as far as the Holy Spirit was concerned. Maybe it was that all Simeon had as a prompting from the Holy Spirit was a desire to go to the temple on that particular day at that particular time. Maybe that's all it was. He was actually told that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ. So maybe it was that he went on every day. I don't know. But we do know this, that when he understood what God's will was, he did something about it. I came across this verse years ago. I know you've heard it because I mentioned it. John 13, 17, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, If you know these things, happy are ye if you think about them, meditate on them, write them down and memorize them. No, what did he say? Happy are ye if you do them. We heard a message just recently. We talked about the wise man and the foolish man. Built his house upon a rock, upon sand. Storms came, so forth and so on. One held, one, one felled, right? What's the difference? They heard the same story. They heard the same, same standard. They knew what they should have done about it. But one did and one didn't. Simeon was a wise man, undoubtedly, because he did what the Holy Spirit prompted him to do. Now let's go a little further. Let's look at his testimony. Verse number 30. It says, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. I can remember hearing a story about Dr. Bob Sr., who was the founder of the university that I graduated from in Greenville, South Carolina. Dr. Bob Sr. was an evangelist and traveled extensively in evangelism while being president of the university that bears his name. A lady came up to him at the close of a service and she had a brand new baby, just a few days old. Must have been a godly woman because she wanted the baby in church to hear Dr. Bob Sr. She brought this bouncing bundle of baby joy up to Dr. Bob Sr. And I, his son, Dr. Bob Jr., told the story to the preacher boys, of which I was one. And he said, my father... This lady came up to him during after the close of a meeting and basically just threw this child at him. And what are you going to do? You're not going to go, oh. Wow. <laughs> what were you trying to do? What were you thinking, right? He, he took this baby, and according to what Dr. Bob Jr. said, his father looked at this child and said and commented, not to this woman, to his son. 
and said, that little boy was one of the ugliest children I think I've ever seen. But here's, here's, here's mom, right? She is overjoyed. She got this bouncing bundle of joy right here, and she wanted Dr. Bob Sr. to say something and bless him or whatever she wanted him to do. I don't know if she expected him to kiss him or whatever, but he got to looking at this baby, and she said, isn't he pretty? What do you think of my little boy? And Dr. Bob Sr., according to his son, who told us in Preacher Boy's class, just simply said, that's a baby, and handed her back, him back to his mom. This baby that we're talking about here, doesn't matter what he looked like, doesn't matter if he was ugly, doesn't matter if he was beautiful, you know what he was? The salvation of the world. Now again, how amazing would that have been to be able to see that and hold that? Matthew 1 and verse 21, the angel tells Joseph as he's contemplating whether or not to put Mary, his espoused, away because she's with child, which is obviously not his. The angel says to Joseph in Matthew 1, And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. There he is. Simeon's got a hold of him. How cool would that have been? Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He is the salvation of the world. His name is Jesus. His name is not Muhammad. His name is not Krishna. His name is not Buddha. His name is not the Dalai Lama. His name is not the Pope. His name is Jesus. And Simeon gives this testimony. How many of us during the Christmas season do that? Beyond that, how many of us, any time we're out and about, point others to Christ? Because he is the only one. He told his disciples some 30 years after this event, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Period. End of story. Mic drop. Some folks might say, well, you know, that's for you. You're, you know, you're, you're a graduate of Bob Jones University, and that's what they teach, and you're a Baptist, and that's what they believe, and you pastor an independent fundamental Baptist church, which I guess that's what you're teaching your people. But for me, it's different. No, I'm sorry, my friend. It's not different. It's the same for everybody. He is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, period. And this is part of Simeon's testimony. The fact that Jesus is the salvation of God. Jesus is also the light of the nations. Look at verse number 32. He says, a light to lighten the Gentiles. Aren't you glad Aren't you glad that Gentiles can be saved? Amen. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? Because if not, we'd all been converted, right? We'd all be Jews, right? I remember my first college, San Angelo, Texas. I was at Angelo State University. I had a friend of mine. 
fellow that I met from there, he was from Copper's Cove, Texas. He decided that he wanted to go to heaven. His roommate and I got to be friends. He was a Christian. His, his roommate was a Christian. And this roommate of his, this other friend of mine, Mike, was not, but he wanted to go to heaven. So you know what he did? He became a Jew. That's what he did. He went down to the synagogue in San Angelo, Texas, and what, went through whatever process it was that they had in order to join their synagogue and convert to, uh, to uh, Judaism, and thereby he became one of God's chosen people. End of story. On his way to heaven, right? Sorry. Nope. Just joining the church, just being baptized, just doing good, just giving whatever to the church, just going on some pilgrimage, just whatever it is you think you need to do. If it's not putting your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross as payment for your sin, I'm sorry to have to tell you, you might be a really nice person, but you're not on your way to heaven because you don't have a relationship by faith, by grace, through faith. With Jesus Christ. But he is the light of the nations. Look if you will. I should have had you hold your fingers in Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Look, hold your fingers in Luke and go to Isaiah chapter 9. Look at verse number 2. Isaiah says in, in, in chapter 9, verse 2, Isaiah 9, 2 says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of shad the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Who is that light? Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Isn't it wonderful that God sent his son to be the light of the world? To pierce the darkness of our sin. To, to expose, and this is tough too, to expose our sinfulness and our, our need of salvation. Our need of having our sins forgiven. To repent, absolutely. And oh, by the way, guess what? Simeon has it in his hands. How cool would that have been? <clears throat> Lastly, Jesus is the glory of Israel. Verse 32 says, A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. The Jews don't see it today. They didn't back then. They did not claim him as the Messiah. You know what they did 33 years after this event? You know what they cried out? Crucify him. And you know what happened? They crucified him. God has set the Jews aside for a time, but one of these days, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be a time, a literal thousand-year span of time on this earth when their Messiah sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem and rules the entire planet on which we stand. There will be joy in Jerusalem like there has never been before. It's kind of sad if you think about it. Much of the Old Testament points to this boy who would go on and die for them. And yet what did they do? They rejected him. And it's not just Jews. It's millions around the world today that hear the story of the nativity, that hear the story of Calvary. Just a few months later in April, when we celebrate the resurrection, and what do they do? They reject it. They turn their back on it. They Turn their back and not their face to the Lord. They stiffen their neck and harden their heart. 
but not Simeon. Simeon is an amazing character. He was just and devout and patient and willing to do what the Holy Spirit of God led him to do. Now, my question to you this morning is this. As you examine your relationship with the Lord, as you consider your worship here this morning, are you just? Are you devout? Are you patient? Are you willing to do what God shows you you ought to do? And part of what Simeon did that God showed him he ought to do is point others to Jesus. Because he is the only way they will ever have their, their, their sins forgiven and have a place waiting for them when they die. Because that's going to happen. Unless the Lord comes back. How, how I say cool, that, that doesn't even begin to, to touch on it, does it? How amazing is that going to be? How joyful is that going to be, right? How miraculous is that going to be if the Lord were to come back before 1130 this morning on the 3rd of December 2023? How amazing would that be? We probably all know, however, people, if that were to happen today, we probably all know people who would be left behind. And, and I hope it's not going to be because, of, obviously and ultimately, it's going to be their decision. I got that. But you see, if we're not just and devout, careful, and obedient to do what God tells us to do while we're in their presence on a daily basis and a regular basis and a mundane basis. We might be looked at and they might say, why do I want to be like them? If religion is so important, if their relationship to God through Christ is as important as they say it is, why do they do, why do they say what they do and what they say? And if that's all it means to them, why would I want that? That's a tragic place to be. Again, ultimately, it's their decision. But we could factor into that unless we are like Simeon and pointing them to Christ by the way we live and the way we obey the will of the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word. We thank you for your testimony of Simeon, this just, devout man who had the amazing privilege of being one of the very first people on this planet to hold your son who came bodily as a baby for the purpose of going and dying for us and for Simeon. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to take his testimony, take his example, and use it for your honor and your glory. May we be careful in our worship. May we be careful in our obedience. May we follow you with a, a reverential fear. Forgive us for the times, Lord, when we just overlook and disregard your word to please ourselves, to please our flesh to make an impression upon somebody else. May we be willing to patiently wait for the comfort that you'll bring. Undoubtedly, many of us have 
been comforted. We thank you for the fact that you are the God of all comfort. And you comfort us in all of our tribulation and trials that we might be a comfort to others who go through those very same things. Help us, Lord, just to trust you and give testimony of who Jesus is. He's the light of the world. The Apostle Paul said, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. We could all put ourselves in that, in that category. And we thank you for sending him for our salvation. Help us to point others to him before it's eternally too late.